minutes or so. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining us uh, for this iteration of the Participedia Teaching Cafe titled Collaboration for Democratic Change. What follows is learnings and lessons from a practitioner engaged, recently published report. But before I introduce the presenters, I actually want to begin with a community land acknowledgement. Although a digital database and global community, Participedia Phase 2 is grounded at McMaster University, which is in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, what is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga nations. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement describes the dish to represent the territory and one spoon to symbolize the peoples living on and sharing the resources of the land only taking what we need and keeping the dish clean. We recognize the ongoing effects of colonial processes of erasure, marginalization, and extraction of which we are all intimately a part of. We encourage all Participedia members and those joining us today to reflect solidaristically on the indigenous sovereignties, colonial legacies, and life relations on the land in which you are residing or find yourself on as you join us today, and to find ways to support those local Indigenous communities. Now into more formal introductions of our speakers. First up, we have George Bolton. George is a PhD in politics at the University of Southampton, and he's the lead RA for the Digital Democracy Cluster of Participedia. His work is on effective polarization and political trust in Great Britain and the EU. Secondly, we have Patty Garcia, uh, who is a relations manager at Engage Britain, a leading civic organization bringing policy processes to people through innovation. They are also a lifelong advocate for marginalized populations and inclusive policy making. Thank you again for joining us today. I now hand it over to you, George. Um, thank you, um, Paul, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming or watching online afterwards. Um, so in this presentation today, I'll open with why these collaborations matter. Why do we care whether academics in, in universities and practitioners in civil societies work together and get the most out of those relationships? Next, I'll be presenting some key findings from the guide that um, that Paul briefly introduced earlier. It's called the Collaboration with Democratic Change and it's aimed at practitioners and academics. It was produced by a small core team, including myself, Professor Graham Smith of the University of Westminster, the EU's Knowledge Network of Climate Assemblies and Participedia, and the Involve Foundation, a leading pu public participation charity in the UK. The guide is part of a movement in the UK to strengthen collaborative bonds between academia and civil society. So the interventions designed to further democratic aims are more effective. Today's workshop is designed to share the work, spread the lessons of the guide and discuss the potentials of these collaborations for democratic change across the world. After presenting the guide, I'll then move on to its relevance to the Participedia community. I'll then hand over to my, poly, um, and my colleague, Patty, who will offer their thoughts on the guide from the practitioner perspective. And then we'll close on a Q&A for, um, for everyone. So I've sort of already said this, but just to be super clear, uh, by academics, we mean everyone in a university setting, all the way from masters or PhD level to professors. Um, and by, by practitioners, we mean anyone working in a non-academic setting. So this could be civil society, nonprofits, social enterprises, anything like that. We left policymakers out of the project just to keep it uh, more manageable, but we had the assumption that a strong partnership between civil society and academia should lead to a greater positive impact on policy. So why are these collaborations so relevant to Participedia? The Participedia website currently showcases over 2,000 cases of democratic innovation 
over 300 methodologies, over 900 organizations, and across 158 countries. The stated audience of the website includes researchers, educators, practitioners, policymakers, and activists. Efforts to strengthen democracy need a diverse range of expertise, skills, and perspectives. These collaborations are simply central to Participedia's work. Cross-sectoral collaborations are needed to fully realize the potential of the extensive network of knowledge and experience that Participedia is. For example, a vast community of academics are currently researching using the Participedia database, generating a wealth of insight into the democratic impact of participatory processes. The rigorous and time intensive research that academics produce can then feed into the relentless efforts of practitioners who strengthen democracies and improve lives through their carefully planned interventions. So I'm just going to briefly go through how the guide was actually made. Um, it began with 15 semi-structured interviews with academics and practitioners from across democracy oriented organisations across the UK. The interviews focused on their feelings about the collaborations, the challenges and opportunities within them, and what advice they would give to people with less experience early on in their career. The interviews were then analysed into six themes, which then formed the basis for two co-design workshops in which around 30 academics and practitioners shared their thoughts on the themes and how to construct a guide out of them that could be practically useful. Lastly, the core team drafted the guide and sent it out for two rounds of feedback from all the participants. So of course, today I'm not going to go through the whole guide. I'm going to just give a quick overview to, to let everyone know what's in it. The seven top tips serve as a sort of executive summary for those short on time. These are seven actionable principles that people can reflect on and hopefully enact so that they can get on their way to being a fully collaborative um, contributor. <clears throat> we then go to six types of collaboration. These are laid out in order from the least time consuming and resource intensive to the most. It was done in this way because it was really important to track in the interviews that we did how really big, impactful projects that you can see on Participedia, for example, began with much smaller ones that built up relationships and mutual trust, and we wanted to lay it out in this way. The next section goes to understanding each other. This section came out of a reoccurring theme from the interviews. Multiple interviewees reflected that it took them years to really understand the other sector, and they wish they could have had all of this information up front to make working together easier. This section explores the differing pressures on individuals from both sectors, some key terminology, and a focus on academia's relatively recent shift to prioritizing the social impact of their research, which we believe is key to accessing resources and support for these collaborations. The barriers to collaboration section focuses on the key challenges and failures that came up in the interviews and explaining why these collaborations can be difficult and success often needs ongoing dialogue, honesty and negotiation from both partners. The next sections, practical advice and next steps, move on to practical guidance. Um, and some of this is quite UK specific, um, but in this workshop, we hope to, to take part in a conversation about how this guidance can be translated to other national contexts. So now I'm going to get a little bit more specific and go through three broad types of collaboration. The first one will be an, an academic assisting a practitioner. This can involve the academic partner providing research skills or knowledge of existing evidence that focuses on solving a relevant problem that, that the practitioner is trying to solve. For example, recruiting participants to their intervention, facilitating a deliberative event, or trying to measure the impact of their project. The second broad type is um, the practitioner assisting the academic. This can involve the practitioner providing access to research participants in their community or insight from their experience working with the public that could be used to inform and refine the academic research. Next is a co-design project, which is probably the most collaborative. This type would, would involve the knowledge and skills of both the academic and the practitioner throughout the whole process. We believe this probably will be the most impactful. Um, and just to kind of uh, illustrate this a bit, so it, you don't have to look far on Participedia to find an example of these collaborations. Any like When you get to a certain size of intervention, they're probably going to involve 
researchers and practitioners collaborating. Um, this one is a participatory slum upgrading process in the city of Buenos Aires, which involved um, the National Department of Housing, researchers from the, from, um, the new school based in New York City, and obviously the community itself. So what was the academic input into this project? That the academic researchers integrated an evaluative framework through, um, from the beginning to the end of the project, focusing on key outcomes such as whether community members had a genuine input through each stage of the project. The evaluative framework was then the basis for an ongoing monitoring process, which ensured that the impact was measurable and stated aims were central throughout. Now, what was the practitioner input? A participatory community management board was maintained so that local community leaders and members were embedded throughout the design and implementation of the process. Each individual upgrading project was designed to reflect each slum's particular social composition and their community governance structures. And the results. So what came out of this collaboration? The academic evaluation gives a comprehensive record of the project's successes and um, limitations, including, including the numerous tangible benefits to the community that practitioners facilitated. This evidence is now publicly available in multiple formats that can now inform and shape future projects with similar aims. Um, so just to kind of do a little counterfactual, um, if there was no academic input, there may not be that, um, that evidence that could be then used to, for example, win funding, win support or learn from. Barrister collaboration. So um, these all stem, we, we found anyway, from the different incentive structures, which are, are kind of the fundamentals of being in different sectors. Being in different sectors incentivizes different types of work, of course. So if you want to do well in your job and maybe get a promotion, you have to do what's being required of you. So for academics, this normally means winning um, academic grants and famously publishing in, in academic journals. For practitioners, this may involve constantly adapting to the priorities of funders and the needs of their community. These incentive structures obviously shape our priorities when we work and different priorities can mean differing measures of success, different desired outputs from the project and different timescales. Uh, um, sorry, <laughs> um, understandably, different, um, and different priorities can mean that um, certain projects can sl slip down the priority list. And if collaborative projects don't receive any investment of time and resources, that project and that relationship may not progress. So how to overcome these barriers? So we've got, th I've just picked out three key lessons from um, the guide. One is to seek out champions and mentors within and outside your institution. These people can offer guidance and make sure that you avoid common mistakes and spend your time strategically and effectively. Next, take advantage of the academic turn towards social impacts and public engagement. Um, civil society has never been more valuable to universities um, key performance indicators. Practitioners and academics should know the increased value of these collaborations when aiming for funding, support and resources. Finally, begin with building a relationship based on shared values before attempting shorter, less stressful projects. Ev evaluate as you go with honesty and learning throughout. We're all people first and building genuine connections um, will help protect relationships from unexpected challenges and obstacles along the way. And now I'm going to offer some of my own story to try to illustrate how some of the key lessons in the guide can be useful for someone starting their career. I'm obviously a PhD student from the UK, so um, that is a very specific context, but I think some of the lessons learned can be quite general too. So first I'll talk about the story of the guide. During the first year of my PhD, I found a website called Centre for Democracy, which had come, um, and that had on it a very impressive map, um, they, which they called the Democracy Map, which was a database of hundreds of democracy oriented organisations throughout the UK. Um, I decided to reach out to James Moulding, who was one of the co-leaders of the organisation, and we had an online meeting. In the discussion, we got to know each other's backgrounds and interests and ended up discussing how connecting academics in the UK to the democracy map could strengthen bonds between the two communities. He put me in touch with um, two other people he was having a similar conversation with, Jesse Joe Jacobs from Involve and Graeme Smith from the, from the University of Westminster, who you will remember were on the core team for the guide. 
So we formed a, um, a team and then we applied for a small grant from the University of Westminster. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to pay for some time to do the work. Um, a year later, the guide was released and relationships have now been built um, and the possibility of more impactful and ambitious projects is on the horizon. Next, the story of um, how I came to work with Participedia. So before I joined Southampton, I looked or I found Matt Ryan, who was a lecturer in the department. And as it turns out, was on Participedia, I think, near the beginning or, you know, <laughs> definitely for a while. Um, I saw on his website that his work focused on embedding public participation in democratic institutions. So I decided to reach out to have an informal chat about our shared interests. Um, after some persistence on my part, I was um, eventually hired for a Participedia research assistant role and have been lucky enough to contribute since. These two personal stories highlight some key insights from the guide designed to help readers with less experience kickstart their collaborative careers. Reaching out to individuals of shared interest both within and outside your institution is the vital starting point. Getting to know each other and discussing shared values can help build those lasting relationships that are the foundation of effective, impactful collaborations. And with that, my, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, this section's over. Um, um, I really hope to um, hear from all of you either after or during this workshop. And with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Patty. Uh, thanks so much, George. Let me just uh, get my slides up here. If someone can just give me a thumbs up that you can see it. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, thanks again, George. And I'm so excited to be here today and grateful for your time. Uh, when George reached out to me to speak alongside him, I first thought about what I could contribute that hadn't already been said in, in the guide. Um, I'm a strong believer that cross-sector collaboration leads to improved outcomes. At Engage Britain, we often, we've often worked with people from across private, public, and third sector contributors of all organizational sizes and have achieved some exciting results. But I'm not here to discuss Engage Britain and our work, though I will be using some examples throughout. We are here to focus on the awesome value of academic practitioner collaborations. I will be discussing how using a relationship-centered approach could improve or strengthen any future cross-sector collaborations you might have. Uh, the guide has a lot of great advice, some of which I will be mentioning today, and uh, George has mentioned some as well. And I will also go into more detail about tips I've learned along the way in my journey as a practitioner. I highly recommend everyone here and beyond today uh, to read the guide if you are interested in cross-sector collaboration. Today, I will be focusing on some of the barriers between the academic world and the practitioner world, uh, building flexibility into your projects and collaborations, building trust by having honest and open communication, and growing connections, networks, and long-term relationships. As mentioned, I'm Patty, Engage Britain's Relationship Manager. I was born in Mexico and have lived in several places since, but I've called Brighton my home for over seven years now. Let's jump straight into the barriers between the academic world and the practitioner world that can create mutual benefits or mutual strains. Some major barriers that I've experienced between the academic world and the practitioner world fit into three main themes. The timelines we work to, the kinds of information we have access to, and the type of language we tend to use to communicate our ideas with the external world. Let's start with timelines. Practitioners often need to turn uh, around projects, workshops, and reports under very constrained timelines. For example, a project might only last three to four months from scoping, initial setup, partnership building, recruiting, onboarding, delivery, analysis, writing, editing, and publishing results. This varies depending on the organization's funding structure and the project size, and sometimes funding allows for longer projects. But overall, practitioner turnaround times tend to be shorter than in the academic world, as, as results are most useful to politicians when they are very recent. But 
must also ha have evidence of being quantitatively and qualitatively valid. This is where academics and researchers hold very strong cards in their hands. Uh, let's move on to access to information. Academics will most likely have access to expensive databases, journals, academic re repositories, libraries, digital collections, and archives that might be more difficult for practitioners to have access to. Academics are also trained in research and know evidence about what works and what we are trying to do. Academics can help find work from the past that can help prevent repeating work. Academics can also have very valuable experience to share in their research skills. And in many cases, they're very like very skilled subject matter experts. In some cases, academics have a wider understanding of what participatory methods have been used in the, the past, their strengths and lessons learned from other projects. Practitioners could have access to their most recent results from their work and their partner's work. For example, engage written ask participants to complete questionnaires before, during, and after sit-in assemblies and co-design processes. These questionnaires covered a wide range of topics, including whether participants felt heard or included, whether they had a positive experience at the events and how they were managed, whether they would or would not take part again in our future projects or similar initiatives with other organizations, and why or why not. In the past, reasons why participants would drop off from participating resulted mostly from their ability to commit their time to multi-session activities, uh, their health or mental health, and developments in their personal lives, such as new children or other caring responsibilities, a new job, etc. Not all organizations will be able to share results of this kind due to the permissions of the original survey, but it's always worth asking. So let's talk about, about language. Uh, sometimes words can mean different things in different sectors or even between different individuals within the same sector. Uh, always make sure that you're referring to the same thing. I also wanted to highlight that we should all do our very best to use language that is accessible when communicating externally to a general audience. We should avoid acronyms, jargon, or overcomplicated words. Let's all work together to make our results as accessible as possible to everyone. This is particularly important in the democracy sector because our democracies belong to each of us. We need to get as many people as possible interested in our work, its results, and what these mean in real terms. Let's talk about building in flexibility into our projects and collaborations. So how can we work best together, knowing that we are coming from different worlds with our own expectations around output and results. First off, we need to be flexible with each other. Be honest about the impacts and expectations your organizations and funders uh, have set out for you and other elements that you are trying to or must achieve. For example, funding goals, number of publications, type of publications, number of participants, engagement metrics, and other key performance indicators you and your organization might have, and find ways that you can contribute to each other's success. Uh, before you begin working, start by having a conversation about ways of working and expectations that each of you have. Ask questions about communication preferences, working hours, timelines, some of your professional boundaries, and time constraints during certain times of the year. Make sure the project manager and others are aware of dates that are completely out of the question for you, for example, during exam seasons. This is important because sometimes project timelines can change with little notice. If the project manager is already aware of these blackout dates for you, then they'll do their very best to keep this in mind when making changes to the timelines should this become necessary. At Engage Britain, we always try our best to give our participants and audiences a variety of ways of getting involved. I like calling this building in different levels of intensity. A participant contributions could be as simple and as low investment as reading a project update email or completing a short survey of medium intensity, attending an event, or doing a one-to-one -one interview about their experience of taking part in our work, or of high intensity or investment, uh, signing up to a citizen assembly or co-design process that have multiple sessions over several months, and become an advocate and speaking at multiple panels or meetings. Participants might fluctuate between the different levels of intensity throughout time, and this is perfectly okay. The goal is to keep them interested 
uh, for their contributions and involvement to be genuine and something that makes them feel proud and good about themselves. I could spend a long time talking about engaging and incentivizing participants, but let's leave that for another time. Uh, just as there are different levels of intensity of participant involvement, there are many different intensities to get involved in a project, uh, some of which uh, George has mentioned, but I'll just go through them here. Uh, so work with the project team to find ways that you can contribute. Uh, some examples include workshop design, data visualization, research design, and database management, event facilitation, analysis of results, report drafting and editing, being a guest speaker or moderating an event, feedback on a single aspect or throughout, and other asynchronous involvement. This might vary from one organization to another, but communicating directly, clearly, and honestly is the best way to ensure a positive outcome and relationship. Start with small collaborations and build towards larger pieces of work. Have honest communication and mostly be honest with yourself. You might be super interested in taking part, but do not have the time and or resources at the moment. And if your availability changes, be honest and communicate this as soon as possible, usually to the project manager. You can suggest someone that you could job share with or that could take over the work from you. Building trust can take time. Uh, here are some examples of useful conversations to start off with. Make time to get to know the project team as professionals beyond the project. A good place to start is what motivated them to join the sector, what makes them feel good in their job, what they feel they can contribute, and what they need help with. If you are on a friendly enough basis, get to know them as humans. You can ask questions like, where did you grow up? What are your hobbies? If you have mutual hobbies, maybe go do a hobby together one day after work. And do you have family? How are things outside of work? Use conversations to identify your shared values and how you can contribute to each other's goals or meld different incentive structures. Then build on these to sh uh, these shared values and incentives. For example, like strengthening or increasing the use of participatory methods and policy-making procedures or improving access and quality of a service. Academic publications can take longer than practitioners have the flexibility to wait for as in practitioners usually need to publish results as soon as possible. Keep this in mind as publications in academic, academic journals can come later. This shouldn't stop you from collaborating though. Collaborations could be a great opportunity to get published in a different sector. Practitioner reports are usually publicly available and will be distributed to a wide audience. I've talked a lot about difficulties and compromises involved in working together, so uh, let's talk about one of the most obvious payoffs of this collaboration. The power of a diverse network is built on trusting relationships. It is becoming more and more important to apply to funding and join applications from across sectors. Reach out to organizations or people you know and have built trust in previous projects about potential joint projects with funding that you come across. Some democracy or participatory method practitioners will often change from topic to topic as their projects change, health, environment, housing, and social infrastructure, and just about anything that you can imagine. As part of most or all projects, practitioners will often contact other organizations that have done work on the subject to explore lessons learned and recommendations. There is a great opportunity here to be mentioned and get introduced to other organizations that might be interested in working with you. It would be impossible for someone to be an expert in such a wide range of topics. This is why working with people who are experts, whether by profession, lived experience, or research or methodology is so important. Each viewpoint will have something very meaningful to bring to the table, and it is important to always be willing to listen to other points of view, but also very importantly for you to share your own, so speak up. While living in Mexico, I did a degree in psychology focusing on social psychology. Creating professional relationships can be like creating new friendships. In social psychology, we often describe the following, uh, the four factors that can contribute to the creation of new relationships. These are proximity, either physical or functional, the latter being how often you encounter the other person. Familiarity is how similar the person is to what we are accustomed to being in contact with. 
similarity is how similar we are to the other person and reciprocity or feeling like all parties are equally benefiting from an exchange or interaction. Though the previous factors are normally used uh, to explore factors that affect friendships and attraction, I believe that they can be applied in a professional relationships or professional attraction. Uh, bear with me with this less than great metaphor. So proximity, is there someone that can introduce you or can vouch for you? This helps uh, build trust from the get-go. Familiarity, how comfortable you are with working with someone outside your sector and what skills you have that could help each other achieve your shared or individual professional goals. Similarity, building on shared values and desired outcomes. And reciprocity, how can you balance each other's person, each person's goals? How can you build up towards having more mutual benefits and uh, from future collaborations? Having a person on your project that focuses on creating journeys for participants, partners, and collaborators can help a project be successful. This could be part of someone's job, but it's most effective when you are able to invest the resources to having a person focusing solely on this important skill, even if they're across multiple projects. This person's role is to make sure to build in different ways for people to be involved, of course, of low, medium, and high intensity. And if there's only one thing you take on, you take away from my rambling today, don't feel like you need to do everything yourself or within your organization. Sharing opportunities should go both ways and the best outcomes and most powerful impacts come from the great collaborations. I'm always happy to keep the conversation going today and beyond or explore ways of working together. I will share my LinkedIn profile link in the chat in just a moment, or you can scan the QR code if you have the LinkedIn app on your phone. Please do get in touch. Thank you for being here and listening and back to you, Paul. Thank you for those contributions, learnings and lessons, George and Patty. Uh, so now it's time to turn it over to the audience for a general Q&A. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand, type it in chat. If you do not feel comfortable, uh, doing so, please, you can message one of us, the organizers. If you would like uh, an opportunity to speak or share on video, please do so. Please just raise your hand. I mean, oh, uh, Joanna, I see you there. Uh, I bent a virtual hand uh, raising, but <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I can uh, never miss that. Thank you so much, thank Joanna, you, please. Paul. I just want to say congratulations. What a wonderful resource. I, I feel like I need to look at it more carefully to be able to ask this, any kind of meaningful question, but I'd be, be curious is using the guide, is that something that you've taken into uh, the beginning of a collaboration and just having people work through, or is it something that you just suggest we all take a look at and then keep in mind as we start to develop and or continue our relationships with um, you know, different partners in our research. Just um, so, uh, um, uh, and thanks for the question, first of all, Joanna. And um, yeah, it, um, it is quite a, a new um, resource. So it only came out in July, um, but we are really hoping for um, people to, um, like if they are using the guide and finding it useful, we'd love them to be in touch. It would be great to have some case studies or success stories um, developing about how it was useful to people. Um, and one of the ideas we've had so far is disseminating it, particularly among PhD students, for example, um, people who are just at the start of their careers and wanting to um, wanting to start to build these relationships. That's great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and, and Maria, I think as well, has, um, has got her hand up. Uh, thank you very much. I I um, learned about this uh, through George, actually, uh, who is now um, doing a, a semester abroad in, in Mexico, and, and I have the pleasure to be working with him. But now listening to him and to Patty, uh, knowing that you spent time in Mexico, I was wondering uh, if you are uh, considering making this available in other languages so that um, other people in other countries uh, can benefit from from this great effort that you guys are, are putting forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm always happy to work with George to translate into Spanish. <laughs> so 
So, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and one of our ambitions definitely is to see how it would translate to other contexts. So if anyone is interested in that, um, like personally, um, it's been a long journey to try to understand the the um the jargon and the just all of the um, different regulations and reports coming out in the UK about academia becoming more focused on social impacts. So um hearing how that differs in different countries and different universities, I think would be really fascinating for the project going forward. Any other questions? Uh, Rosa, please. Hello, and I want to also start by congratulating what you're doing. Um, I feel very strongly about the value of practitioner-academic collaborations. Um, I'm a bit of a hybrid. I uh, have been a practitioner for 20 plus years and have now recently completed a PhD. And where the focus of the PhD was listening to practitioners, uh, specifically facilitators and um, highlighting their voice. So I really, I took a quick skim through the recommendations in the manual that you sent out. I particularly appreciated the one where you were saying, you know, do not look at practitioners as just objects of study, but also as potential collaborators. Um, so yeah, so so I guess my question is, you know, where the notion of pracademics fits into your model, your framework, and also, um, I'm I was very inspired um, by the work of um, uh, the gentleman who wrote a book called The Reflective Practitioner, talking about how practitioners reflect in action. And, and I've, I've been using the term uh, research in action a lot because I think practitioners are often doing experiments, you know, because the situation is different and, and um, generating new and valuable knowledge. So basically, in sum, I, I just want to say thank you. And, uh, and yeah, just any thoughts you might have about uh, mm, pracademics as, as bridge people. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Rosa, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, would you mind running through that one more time? Oh, sure. Just that there's, um, you know, I, I think your guide is awesome. And it's like practitioners over here and academics over here. And I just want to speak as a bit of a mestiza hybrid, you know, like someone who is a practitioner and a researcher now, and just kind of wondering your thoughts on that and where that fits into your scheme. Absolutely. Like, I think the kind of like border that we're kind of drawing here is, is an imaginary one, right? And oftentimes like these, the I think that the main barrier is, it has to do with like the incentive structures. Um, and, but in the guide uh, and guide, and George will be able to use the languages in the guide, they talk about uh, knowledge. What's what's the what's the word, George? Uh, knowledge, I have it right here. It's really pretty. Exchange. Knowledge, knowledge exchange, exchange, right? Yeah. Like there, there, there are these like different uh, kind of like structures that are being built into universities that are trying to kind of promote this. But this is because like, it, it we need we need to work together not just academics and practitioners but like just everyone needs to work together in order to kind of strengthen our democracies and make sure that everyone that wants to say something or needs to say something has a place to say it and that um, what they say can actually lead to change um yeah and um, um i'd like to add a point on that rosa as well thanks for the um kind words as well on the project um it's been a big theme throughout the project, people that have been both in academia and practice. Um, quite a lot of the interviewees had done that way. Um, and yeah, it was fascinating to hear as a PhD student the often quite difficult journeys that those academics have been on. Um, often um, there have been disincentives for them to do that work, um, such as, you know, just um, less time publishing, basically being the kind of elephant in the room um, and as a PhD student who's interested in, and passionate about this work, who's now planning the next career step for me, I'm hoping that all of the rhetoric and the um, words from universities about how 
collaborations are becoming more important, hopefully that should make that career path easier to straddle both sectors. Um, but yeah, time will tell. And of course, um, it'd be great to hear more about your PhD as well at some point. Shamaya, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for hosting and also George and Patty for your work. Uh, like all the others, I've uh, very much enjoyed your talk and uh, look forward to perhaps even using your, uh, uh, your guide next week because I'm starting a new collaboration with an academic. Uh, because it's, yeah, well, at least I thought before I even saw this uh, coming up on my page, I was thinking about, hey, we should really <laughs> get the academics involved in trying to get some new uh, theory and insights into the practice. As someone who comes from the theory side first as a student and having my uh, thesis writing about uh, participation and democracy, uh, now I'm in the field and now I'm trying to find ways to get this new state of the art theory into practice, but I'm having a hard time doing so. So I'm having also a doubt here or a question maybe for the group or perhaps George or Patty or anyone else can jump in. Um, do you also have maybe uh, ways of getting it off the ground? Because I'm having a hard time, even if there's a collaboration with an academic, of getting the new insights and the state of the art into the practice. Because the practitioners don't have the time to do the R&D, and the academics are, well, overworked as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm just looking at the practical side here. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks for that um, question, Shamia. And yeah, it's um, I think it comes back to this big buzzword that we keep using, incentives. And I know like um, in the community organizing world that I was in partly before the PhD, it's all about in incentives and interests. People are only going to commit their time and resources when it's in their interest to do so. So if there's no time being made for the project yet, it may be because some or like... Um, of those parties involved may not be convinced yet that doing so is in their interest. Um, and as you say, with with like prior commitments and being overworked, um, I know for, like in my, like I'm only a PhD student, so I'm kind of just dipping my toe into the world of academia, but I know that things can quickly pile up and then you have to turn things down that you would like to do. So I know that must also be a danger. Um, but yeah, it will be fascinating to hear how that project develops. And um, also would love to hear if um, you use the guide and if it was useful. And yeah, these are really great questions. Are there any more from the audience? If not, I maybe I can just, oh yes, please, please. Oh, I have one that was, uh, that was sent in um, that I'll pose. It's sort of on this same topic, so it fits in well with um, managing timelines and constraints and that sort of thing. Um, and so someone asked um, specifically to Patty, as a practitioner collaborating with a researcher, how did you manage this additional workload? Do you find it straining? Do you find it manageable? What are sort of some practical uh, maybe um, sort of steps and that sort of thing to, to manage on the practitioner side? Uh, well, So just like academics, practitioners are are quite busy, um, and I'm assuming like a lot of academics, it it involves working on weekends and stuff like that because like uh, oftentimes citizens citizens assemblies need to happen on weekends. Um, I am quite fortunate that Engage Britain is a very flexible employer. So if there are times where like work's a bit lower, I can take a break. I don't have to be on my computer if I don't have a meeting and I don't have work to do, which is rare, but like, uh, you know, and then if I need to stay a bit after, that's what it is. But like, I think for me, and I think I'm quite biased in this because like, I, I love what I do. I've been dreaming about something like this since I was like a kid. So it doesn't really feel like I'm at work when I'm at work. Right. Um, but uh, I guess like, I kind of, kind of like I, what I said was like about like honest communication. If like you're seeing that things are just piling up too fast, 
uh, just communicate as quickly as possible with the project team or with like the, the people that you're working with, regardless of the sector that they're from. And, and just let them know, like, be honest. Um, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay. like, no one's going to think that like, you're not great. Like they're working with you because they think you're great. And like, just, just communicate as quickly as possible. Hope I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and Luna, please. Oh, hi, everyone. Oh, my voice nearly went there for a second. Um, <laughs> I am in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I'm so glad to have come across um, the space when I was doing some professional development digging online. Um, so I'm a practitioner academic. Um, I'm, a drama I'm a drama facilitator. I do work in applied drama uh, in community settings, in schools, in prisons, in old age homes. That's, that's what I do. But I'm also a teacher. I'm a high school teacher. Um, uh, grade 10 to 12 or drama um i because i'm interested in you know the professionalization of a teacher i think oh let me just also say let me give you some context in light of um the opening i suppose preamble that paul gave um i come from south africa as i mentioned and in south africa particularly in the realm of teaching um there have been legacies of inequalities in teacher education um Throughout history, um, uh, teachers have um, entered the profession for different reasons, either because they were forced to by race, but that also um, affected the kinds of um, um, teacher education that they received. Um, uh, because I'm interested in, you know, the professionalization of a, a teaching identity uh, uh, from a, a uh, where teachers become more critically re critically reflexive, recognizing how they teach, why they teach, um, and how they show up in classroom spaces. Um, uh, I see myself as a bit of a uh, you know uh, academic assisting practitioner to use some of the language that um, that George used. Uh, uh, and yeah, I'm also reframing the teacher as a sort of civil society worker because teachers are actively there on the ground trying to make change, um, whether intentional or uh, unintentional. They are there. They are busy shaping lives, they're busy shaping futures. So um, the collaboration guide um, was uh, extremely useful in terms of me making sense of a lot of the collaborations that I had in the past. And um, I'm interested in knowing if George or Patty, if either of you could answer or respond to this, what are some of the learnings or things that you think um, I should take into account from my perspective and privilege, I suppose, as an, as an academic in advocating for, you know, collaborations like this, where I work with teachers um, uh, to, to sort of like, you know, come to terms with their teaching identity or recognizing their teacher identity, uh, particularly when teachers or civil society organizations or education sectors, schools um, might not entirely see the relevance in, 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 in the work. Um, um, Patty, would you like to um, go first? Or yeah. So just to be clear, um, first of all, thanks for the question, and, and and your work sounds absolutely fascinating and and very very important. Um, so just to be very clear on the question, is it that you're having trouble convincing the teachers or the university of um, of the value of this um, collaboration? So um, as an academic um, university or um, in the university has, has Luna left? Okay, hopefully she'll come back. I'm so sorry, my my connection dipped there for a second. Um, I was saying, I was clarifying that um, research or academia recognizes the importance of this, but this doesn't uh, obviously equate to you know um, the same need or want um, on the ground being in the classroom as teachers. And also, I'm I'm also coming here from a perspective of recognizing that um, as an academic or as someone who has you know progressed through the academic levels or NQF levels, um, as they call it in South Africa, um, I have you know um, attained a certain amount of privilege and knowledge on certain things and it's very important for me to negotiate that privilege as I enter these spaces with people that 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 um that where they are I'm recognizing that there's a power imbalance between um, academics and 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 civil society workers or practitioners sometimes um yeah yeah that's a really really important point and the issue of a power imbalance happened a lot 
um, sorry, like it, it came up a lot within the project. And um, I think I'll go back to like a problem solving perspective on this. Um, I think the, like the more you get to know the practitioners you want to collaborate with, the more you'll learn about the problems they're facing. And I'm sure that anyone facing a problem will be interested in evidence on what can help to solve that problem, especially if it's specific and accessibly um, com um, communicated to them. Um, I think that was what the guidance was in the guide and what came out in the project, which is that we, we wanted to try to encourage a sort of shift from um, academics seeing practitioners as kind of, as we've already said before, a resource and more thinking as an academic with all of this privilege and um, position I have, how can I best use what I've learned, the skills, to help practitioners? Um, so I think hopefully that's the sort of message we can get across. Uh, I guess I would I would also add that um, there are like funding bids and funding applications out there that you can that like will require cross sector collaboration. So if you bring those to the people that you're trying to get them to like take it seriously, um, you can see that like that that they're they'll be like oh, but if we want this money, then we need to work across sectors. And also like one one of the challenges that I'm sure happens in like the academic world, like all the time. Um, but in, in my experience, in like uh, like from the practitioner side, is that like the community needs and the funder needs and the what they desire, what they want, all these kind of things, like they can change at the drop of a hat. And not only like, so so like that's that's particularly like one of the like the biggest challenges that, that we have as practitioners that like we might think that a certain methodology or a certain um like activity would work better than in the other. Um, but then you like like then you have like a for example like a, a a community that needs something else or a funder that requires something else and then you just have to like change that like sometimes sometimes like we'll be changing the workshop design five minutes before like a 16 week project kicks off right like we have people in the waiting room and we're like changing everything like and it's just one of those things right like um uh so yeah I, I hope that helps so we have time for one final question uh any volunteers any lasting questions of course the both participants can be contacted afterwards but i guess I, maybe i can ask something it's a bit on my mind, and it was implicit throughout both of your conversations. I think for George, it was a little more direct. But how do you think about co-design and the co-design process? Uh, I, I would love to hear your both thoughts on that, because this is very much becoming a hot button topic right now. Uh, and so just any insights that you can offer would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, um, I'll go quickly, Patty, and I'll give you enough time to respond as well. Um, I think... Yeah, the kind of power imbalance in co-design is obviously something that's probably been there since the beginning of, of that started to happen. Um, and I think if we're going to see it as a, um, because yeah, so the aims, as we've said in the guide, the aims of both people can be the same, um, but because of the different incentive structures and different outputs wanted and so on, um, it is almost inevitable for one to be prioritized over the other. So that Participedia case, for example, they, there was an academic journal article that came out of it. There were also some slides that were published that were very useful for everyone. So I think having that different variety of outputs is really important to make sure that one party doesn't come away with more. And in terms of the co-design process itself, I think it kind of does come down to which one you think to get priority sometimes. Personally, I'm on the side, like if there is a fence, I'm probably on the side of it that thinks that it's the practitioner's problems that should be um, put first in the co-design process and academic skills and expertise should be employed to that end. 
Um, but I think there'll probably be different opinions about that. And of course, it will vary from context to context. I guess like the the only thing to I would add is like, and I, I don't think that that's going to be a problem in this room, uh, but you know, like uh, in, in the general world, a lot of people sometimes use the word co-design or co-production when they're not actually doing co-design or co-production. Um, and it kind of like, stains the people that are actually doing co-design or co-production. Um, I think the, the the huge value that like true co-design has is that everyone entering the room has equal power. Um, that is like one of the fundamental requirements of, of co-design, right? Um, I know that in, in like real world, that doesn't play out that way all the time. Um, and I don't know if I can say that like I would, you know, give more power to academics or more power to practitioners. I like I I am an honest believer that everyone that sits around this table um has something extremely valuable to contribute. Like that's like I I've seen it in action. I've seen it because like I, I always kind of give this example, like, but like, you know, and it, it doesn't matter how many years you've studied as a like a medical student, a medical doctor, um, a specific condition, even if you like specialized it and have treated it for like 30 years, unless like you've lived with the condition yourself, you don't know what it's like to have the condition. And like you need to ask the people that have the condition what it is like having it. And not only from like one person, but many people, because like different like even the same condition can be like experienced subjectively very differently from person to person yeah thank you for that final analogy uh, what spot on once again patty uh and if there's no other questions i'll just do one last scope of the audience uh, i will pass it over to george patty is there any final concluding thoughts uh before farewells no uh, um, so um I'll just very, very quickly say that thanks again for coming and for listening. Um, and we we want this to be very much part of a discussion, hopefully as diverse as possible. So we strongly recommend anyone to reach out to us. Yeah, and as managing director on behalf of Participedia and the Participedia community, thank you, George. Thank you, Patty, for the sharing of these learnings. Uh, and thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us uh, virtually. Uh, as I said before, this recording will be made available on our social media channels and YouTube. Uh, thanks again. Have a wonderful day.